Hi, I'm Jane McCallion. And I'm Adam Shepherd. And you're listening to the IT Pro Podcast. We're often told that programming has become a key skill for everyone to learn. Knowing how to code is almost on par with being able to read and write or do maths, to the point that it's even been added to the national curriculum. With the number of jobs unfilled in the tech sector, it's easy to see why this wisdom prevails. But coding isn't just one monolithic thing. There are multiple languages that are useful for different things, and what you choose to learn will influence the direction of your career. Should you start with one of the more easy to learn languages, for example, or is it worth the blood, sweat and tears of learning something more niche? Joining us to talk about all this is Jess Craig, Associate Solutions Engineer at Twilio. Jess, welcome. Thanks very much, Jane. Hello. Hello. Thanks thanks for having me. (laughs) So could you tell us a little bit about your background? Because you didn't start off as a programmer, did you? Correct. Yes, I am one of the many in the tech industry at the moment who has come from a non-traditional background um, and definitely does not possess a computer science degree. <laughs> um, even though um, I don't know, I definitely recommend um, if anyone has a, an interest in, in tech, I think studying up a little bit on computer science is definitely a, um, a fun endeavour that Depending on your definition of the word fun, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I started, I've come from a self-taught background. Um, so I think like a lot of people, I was first introduced to code around the age of MySpace. Um, uh. You know, <laughs> exactly, war memories. Uh, cut my teeth on kind of playing around with HTML templates and, and that sort of thing. And I think just generally through... Um, through kind of my previous career um, as a kind of working in sort of press and content, um, I started to become more aware of d- different roles in technology and um, started to kind of pursue a, a couple of self-guided courses at home. So would you say then the reason that you moved from sort of, I guess, a media background to mm. more of a technical uh, career, was it led by like I said, you know, there is this kind of you know, the tech skills gap or and you know, observing that or was it more, I guess, that um, you, know, you realised that you had this interest and decided to pursue a bit of a passion? I think it was it, it was definitely a combination of those two. Um, the passion for technology was def- was definitely there and is is still there. I'm not using past tense. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just caught myself. There. Um, but I think um, there was something about tech. Um, I went along to a couple of um, meetups uh, put on by uh, this organisation called Code Bar, which I just hugely recommend to anyone who's looking to get into tech. Um, they're still doing a lot of work, uh, virtual workshops and remote friendly. Um, events so definitely check them out um, but I think by going along to kind of code bar a couple of code bars meetups um, I, I not only sort of realized how accessible a career in technology was and also just kind of remembered how enjoyable I found solving problems because essentially the kind of the the job of a developer in in one way is kind of just a continuous pu- puzzle solver um, but I think I also kind of had this feeling that I'd met my people and I know that sounds strange <laughs> but <laughs> just the culture felt right the, it just felt like I'd found something that I was looking for in a lot of other industries and careers and it just was sitting there. So let's talk a little bit more about how you made that switch because mm. you know coming from a, a background with no kind of professional or formal coding education, mm-hmm. what what was your kind of first step towards teaching yourself programming on a kind of practical level? What uh, languages did you decide to start off with? So um, I think like a lot like a lot of people, I started out. Um, I was fixated on that how question for a long time. Mm. Uh, I think there was no kind of there's no sort of one size fits all answer really to that. You've just got to kind of try and just just you know, there, there is no try, you've just got to do to kind of <laughs> inelegantly quote Yoda. Um, but I started off with Code Academy's kind of beginner HTML and CSS courses, but then quite quickly, I think, um, after figuring out how much I hated CSS, um, you kind of get <laughs> driven towards, <laughs> you get <laughs> driven towards this path of JavaScript, which um, I massively, hugely recommend to anyone who's trying to get into coding, because JavaScript is one of the few languages that um, you need very little in terms of your own 
local environment to kind of get it going you can open up a browser in chrome go to inspect element click on the console and there you can kind of start typing some little javascript commands and just log some things to the console and get going so yeah mm. i think javascript is definitely the sort of like lowest barrier to entry kind of well, one of them. Um, I think Python's a really good one as well because Python is, um, you know, you've, I've heard you talk a lot about Python on this show in terms of its <laughs> relation to machine learning and uh, mm. those kind of worlds. But Python is just so, it's it's really lends itself to kind of mathematical brains because it's very legible, it's very easy to easy, easy to read. Mm. I mean, we're, we're lucky mm. it's in English um, <laughs> for the most part, so <laughs> that's great. Um, but um yeah python is very much sort of like as long as you've kind of got the bodmus you know you 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 know your order of brackets and multiplication and division then you should be able to get on with python and build a simple um database accessing website mm. and the fact that python's been around for as long as it has means that there's tons and tons of resources for you know people that are just getting started out or even people that want to take an existing familiarity with Python and scale it up to start working with things like data science or machine learning or, or more advanced uh, applications. There's a huge amount of resources out there. But I want to just uh, briefly revisit JavaScript. Um, obviously, it's the first language a lot of people start with for all of the reasons that you've mentioned. It's you know very easy to pick up and play, as it were. You know, There's a lot of there's an immediacy to JavaScript, mm. I feel like. You can get up and running and actually start seeing some tangible changes. You can actually start doing very tangible things with JavaScript very quickly, which gives you a real sense of achievement and progress if you're just starting learning something. But I want to talk about some of the some of the applications of JavaScript, the mm -hmm. extensibility. So... As a JavaScript developer, what were the first things that you built, if you like, in terms of, you know, projects and things like that? Um, I think everyone, I, I believe it's almost like a soft requirement to be a developer that you need to make a to-do list app within your first <laughs> month. <laughs> everyone hates them and no one uses them after they make them, but everyone makes them. But it's such, a, it is an important exercise, I guess, because it helps you, um, in order to make a, a JavaScript based kind of to-do list app, you've got to use, so you've got to write node. Mm. So the kind of back end equivalent, I guess, of JavaScript, mm. um, you've got to stand up a server because you're essentially like ho you're hosting tasks. You're kind of doing those um, those kind of CRUD mechanisms those kind of core server mechanisms. So you're kind mm. of either creating an item, reading an item, updating an item or deleting an item. Mm. Um, so it kind of teaches you those kind of principles of like working with servers and APIs. Um, and then on top of that, you get to do a bit of um, a bit of styling and a bit of animation and mechanics because your app is doing something. There's a bit of obvious user interaction. Then you get to kind of um, look at how you kind of implement the you know, use JavaScript as a I think a bit the, of a front end engine, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, a bit more of a front end engine. It's kind of like um, a lot of people kind of talk about building a house and if HTML and CSS are kind of the um, you know, the brickwork, the foundations and the kind of the cosmetics of the house. JavaScript is the plumbing, mm. um, making everything work. So We love a house analogy on this podcast. Well, we love a house analogy on this <laughs> I'm podcast. so sorry, I'm definitely the 15th person to bring that up on the uh, other <laughs> Well, the other 14 are Jane, so you're fine. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess what I'm taking from this as well is that, you know, JavaScript as a beginning point is quite you know, good. And when you speak about the to-do list, it's easy to use it to create digital versions of stuff that you just, everybody knows what a to-do list is, mm. whether you call it a to-do list or, I don't know, something else. Or like yeah. a uh, planner. Productivity or... engine. Or... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we've, we, you know, we've all seen one. We've all written one, you know, either by hand or used another app. So that kind of practical but simple idea is, it seems like, you know, whether it's JavaScript or, or anything else, seems like quite a good place to start rather than this ethereal idea of learning a new language effectively. Oh, completely. Um, I don't know whether or not I'm jumping off too soon off the, off the back of what you've just said, but um, a, a friend of mine recently um, decided to 
kind of enter the, the tech world. And we we're kind of talking about what makes a good portfolio and what makes a good project to kind of host in your portfolio. And the reason why I think people kind of gravitate back to to-do lists again and again is because it's kind of solving an obvious business problem using technology and incorporating some kind of thought around user experience. It's kind of those three things that you really need to capture in any project that you put on your portfolio are right there. But, but I think the to-do list app is a, a great example of a perfect starter project because mm. it is kind of, as you as you mentioned, it is all of the various bits rolled into one, but in a very easily manageable and easy to get your head around way. You know, I think a lot of people think of, you know, learning to code and thinking, oh, I've got to, I've got to come up with an idea for an app and it has to be, you know, really innovative and really in depth. And it's got to include all of these features and, that can make it incredibly daunting to to actually get started because you've got this whole hill to climb before you've written your first kind of line of code. Mm. No, it's I think that kind of whole problem of where do I even start is is emblematic of entering the tech industry. I think it's I don't know, one of the reasons why I think JavaScript is also such a good language to start with and potentially stick with throughout your career is that it's particularly relevant at the moment. It's been relevant for the kind of past five to five years. I mean, I would say so. Yeah. Really, ever ever since the explosion in uh, web apps, I think yes. is, is when JavaScript really started to to take hold in the kind of major major way that that it did. And for all their foibles, I think Facebook's kind of standing behind React has kind mm. of helped a lot more companies create web apps that work on mobile. You mm. don't, they, it does, it's kind of taken away that sort of way that like mobile development used to be siloed. So I mm. think kind of the, yeah, the advent of like React and um, TypeScript in particular is just, yeah, I think it's just kind of kept JavaScript at the kind of forefront of web development in my eyes i think javascript's the cool language i think i mean yeah very very much so it's yeah. it's very much the the kind of default go to for i think most new developers but i think something that's really interesting is the amount of the increase in portability between mm. uh, programming languages we've had a lot of developments in recent years a lot of them from microsoft oddly enough in making uh applications and frameworks much more cross compatible mm. uh, which i think has been really helpful for extending that flexibility across a range of different kind of uh, platform surfaces and uh, application frameworks we're going to take a quick break now but when we come back we'll be talking about some of the other languages on offer including some of the oldest see you after the break Welcome back. Now, Jess, we've spoken a bit about some of the more common uh, languages, particularly JavaScript. Uh, some of the more esoteric languages, mm. though, have been around for a long, long time. We've spoken previously on the show about languages like COBOL, which is still in surprisingly widespread use in enterprise IT, particularly in the arena of mainframes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's worth new developers putting the time in to learn some of these less widespread languages in comparison to some of the more popular ones? I definitely think it's worth new developers um, taking a closer look and potentially building one or two projects in a language that they're less familiar with that has these kind of tendencies of, of legacy languages like COBOL. So for example, um, I've been learning a lot of C recently. Um, mm. uh, it's been really useful for um, just kind of a computer science kind of foundation course that I've been doing um, in the background. Um, and it's it's great because as programming languages themselves have, have evolved over the past um, you know, couple of decades, we've kind of, um, we dress them up more and more to kind of disguise the things that they do in the background, like compiling. Mm. <laughs> um, so, um, and for instance, with um, with Python, you never need to stop and compile Python. That's why it's one of that's one of the reasons why it's so great if you're a beginner, because um, you don't really need to kind of stop and make several versions of your code to be able to launch your executable program. But 
no, I think kind of taking a step back into um, look at some look at look at the more like legacy languages is really beneficial because it just reminds you of how consequential each design decision you make that you make is like every single step that you program into your software it will take a certain amount of computing power and that will be replicated and that will be reflected in the kind of the time it takes to load your program and no user has <laughs> users have a, a you know waning patience as it is when it comes to kind of loading up software programs so i think it's just really important to kind of um remind yourself of some of the tech principles i guess we've kind of come to take for granted in the advent of tech yeah Hmm. i guess some of the you know one of the benefits it sounds like of uh, python in particular is that it is similar to natural language rather than maths or Mm. (laughs) or uh, algebra um i mean you say that you've been learning c and obviously you have a background in javascript and python what other languages uh, if any have you picked up or are you thinking of picking up as you go along so i um i've worked with ruby for a while really Mm. really love ruby um i think ruby on rails has got like quite a good um presence in the um, in the tech sector, I think more mm. and more companies have been picking up uh, Ruby within their tech stack over the past couple of years. So it's it's now got a, uh, a a legitimate business use, which was a burn that I think many people had on Ruby uh, programmers mm. for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say Ruby is most uh, useful for in a kind of modern setting? Because I think Ruby is one of the uh, one of those languages that the let's say average non-developer tech person probably isn't that familiar with like most people are most people within tech certainly are kind of familiar with javascript and what it does and you know probably have a passing familiarity with python they've probably played around with a bit of basic in their youth a bit of html but ruby i feel like is a bit more obscure in terms of its applications it is it's kind of I mean, it's really similar to Python in its both its use cases and its its kind of physical representation or digital representation, if we're going <laughs> to talk about it like, accurately. <laughs> um, it's kind of, I think, because... Um, so often people use Ruby on Rails and Rails is a framework with which, with which you kind of, you know, support your Ruby apps on in, mm. in the same way that you would potentially, like, make a Flask application using Python. Mm. You would create a Ruby application using Rails. And Rails quickly generates, like, a really, like, a robust kind of, like, web framework. So when you kind of, like, invoke a Rails app, you have your kind of model control of you. You've got all of your principles there for your web app. So it's really, it's quite a nice way of kind of potentially bootstrapping an idea mm. and um, standing something up quite quite quickly. So you've mentioned uh, a couple of new languages that you're kind of uh, starting to pick up and starting to work on. The question of upskilling and Mm. kind of ongoing learning is one that comes up quite a lot in the context of uh, enterprise software development in particular. How important would you say it is for companies to support that kind of uh, activity for their Uh, developers oh my gosh it's completely vital i think the day that your developers fall out of love with tech and with what they do they kind of they that extends completely to your application and to your to 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 your business I, Mm. i think it's 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 vital especially now we're we're so divided and i think all of our connections have been put through this digital filter now Mm. um our work has become a bit more of a central pillar, I think, to our lives than we'd often like if we are lucky enough to kind of still be in in employment. Mm. I think it's crucial for companies to enable their workforce to kind of keep undergoing professional development, even if that's in, I think it's even more effective if that's through means of uh, like pair programming with people that you otherwise wouldn't Mm. usually pair up with. Like I've recently paired with a principal, um, Uh, solutions architect and that taught me so much in terms of working principles and and just kind of communicating expectations um sometimes i think you you take a lot for granted i think when you're kind of working by yourself you can get used to your own own thought patterns your own processes and um things can kind of quickly become become stale Mm. um, i'd imagine it's easy to get into bad habits that way as well oh absolutely 
yeah ab- absolutely because you're the kind of creative process isn't it you're saying so, you're so forgiving of your own your own foibles hmm. so yeah it does sound both from what you've just said and also um from you mentioning code bar earlier on that this sort of peer-to-peer learning or mentoring is important you know, just generally when it comes to both when you start off learning to code and building your skills throughout your professional career mm. yes no it definitely is it's it's so important because I think people can sometimes look at learning to code as a very isolated skill as learning a list of commands and knowing when to invoke them but the real the best programmers that I've ever met usually have this second instinct when it comes to systems design and choosing good design processes. Um, you're, you've probably heard the uh, the kind of the, the saying "write dry code" before, and how that means um, DRY stands for you know don't repeat yourself. Mm. Uh. So write code that does not repeat itself. And it's when you say that out loud, it can sound like a really simple phrase it can sound like a really simple command but there are a multitude of ways I think we kind of we 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 instinctively pick pick up patterns as human beings and we mimic those patterns in ways that we are often not very conscious of um and the best design the best systems designers and developers are very aware of their own patterns but are also quite tuned into other people's patterns and the only way to do that I think is to keep yourself exposed to different environments and um join in hackathons and chat, stretch yourself to that little bit beyond where you're used to. Mm. Um, so that's why I think JavaScript, that's one of the reasons why I think JavaScript is such a, just a brilliant language to get involved in, because you can kind of have that comfort of coding things that make you, that make sense to you and that build upon your knowledge. But you also have that room to really stretch yourself a little bit and launch a backend application if you're used to being front end or vice versa. Mm. Mm. So for new developers or people who are looking to become developers, what are the kind of top uh, problems or top hurdles that you would warn them to look out for? Oh, my gosh. I think we're all quite familiar with learning plateaus. It Mm -hmm. happens. I think we get used to our own assumptions of a problem. I mean, learning plateaus can manifest themselves in a number of ways. But um, I think there are, there will be times when you will get stuck and you will just need to speak to someone else. And there's nothing you can do about that apart from just speak to someone else. Sometimes it's, it's, it is, it, I know, I don't know whether or not this is a very good an- analogy to use, but it's almost like when you're in a video game and you pick up an important item and you know that this item has something to do with your overall mission, but you don't have the contextual kind of understanding to figure out where it fits into the kind of wider game itself. So sometimes you need to speak to someone else and that's part of the process itself. Mm. I think people shouldn't be too hard on themselves if they don't know everything because a lot of the time... I guess getting someone else's eyes on the problem is is part of solving the problem itself. You can look at the same documentation over and over again. And without that added uh, different perspective, you will be stuck at your same conclusion, same Mm. assumptions. Um, Mm. I just would urge new developers to ask for help and uh, get onto tech Twitter, um, engage Mm. with people that you don't know, and uh, even especially now that a lot of events aren't happening in person. Um, A lot of um, tech community groups like Codebar that I mentioned earlier um, have uh, open Slack groups that you can Mm. register Mm. with and you can join. Uh, Just getting someone else's eyes in front of a problem sometimes does you the world of good. It just opens you up to that new perspective and helps you remember how many different ways there are to find a solution. Mm, Absolutely. And I I think that the developer community online is the most collaborative and the most helpful and the most supportive, um, certainly broadly speaking, uh, one that I think I've ever come across. I mean, mm. tools like Stack Overflow, for example. Oh, yes. I mean, if if every piece of code that had been copied from Stack Overflow was erased overnight, the entire <laughs> IT industry would collapse. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> I think I remember seeing a great XKCD style comic of someone um, sketching an accurate representation of their tech stack and they sketched, (laughs) (laughs) they just labelled 
some tech overflow s- solution that I copied and pasted without without reading properly and understanding. And I, I think <laughs> if, we're, if we're all honest, every developer is guilty of doing that once or twice. But oh, I absolutely. Think, yeah. <laughs> Does it work? Yes, fine, leave it alone. <laughs> I don't need to understand how it works. I exactly. just know you, that it does. If you don't understand how it works, does it even work? I mean, <laughs> kind of, but yeah. I, I, I've just prevented myself from making a car analogy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> restraint, restraint, the amount of restraint going on for me in this podcast. <laughs> it is a car analogy. How much do you need to know the internal workings of any, uh, or how much do you need to know the workings of an internal combustion engine in order to pilot a car? Mm, exactly. It's a car analogy. Yeah, I, I, I see the whole thing that well. Well. Um, <laughs> So Jess, anybody who has been listening to this podcast and is inspired to learn to code, where would you suggest they start? Well, one of the one of the places that um, I've been kind of using, one of the programs that I've been using to kind of practice my coding skills a lot recently has been Twilio Quest. It's, um, it's a really charming um, game that uh, the company that I work for developed um, to t- teach people how to code and to use our various products. So definitely give that a download. Um, you play as a, a hero, um trying to kind of navigate your way through space so that's you know like a nice little added fun narrative exactly (laughs) (laughs) it it makes the days that sometimes if you don't really want to kind of you know figure out how to use docker you can kind of save the world with code uh so that's a really great (laughs) alternative to some places (laughs) some solutions out there but um you know a I wouldn't overthink it. Free Code Camp is awesome, and a lot of really good developers have used their courses. They've got a killer YouTube channel as well with loads of tutorials. So Code Academy is also great. Uh, they've added a bunch of new tracks recently, um, so you can focus on a particular area of development. And um, these tracks kind of give you a little bit of a structure when it comes to upskilling for a particular discipline within web development. So that's pretty useful as well. Well, unfortunately, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this week. But thank you once again to Jess for joining us. It's been great having you on the show. Thanks for having me. You can find links to everything we've discussed today in the show notes and even more on our website, www.itpro.co.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like the show, leave a rating and review to help other people find us. We'll be back next week with more insight from the world of IT. But until then, goodbye. Bye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.